Okay, so measurement and uncertainty. You really can't have a physics lab without dealing with uncertainty in some way. So let's go over the basics. And I'm going to start with this. There you are. You are in a cave. It's dark. You can't see anything. That's not a cave. Okay. Sorry. I messed up my animation. So now you realize that there is a shadow on the wall. This is Plato's allegory of the cave. So the basic idea was a story between uh, Socrates and Plato. I think this is what Socrates told Plato about how philosophers tried to discover the truth. He says that normal humans are like prisoners in a cave and they, they're chained to a wall and all they can see is a shadow on the wall. But wait, I messed this up again. Sorry. So there's actually the shadow on the wall is cast by some object that the prisoner can't see. And then there's some fire behind the object that casts a shadow. And so the philosopher is able to free themselves from the wall and actually see the object. That, that was what Socrates and Plato said. Okay, um, and But they don't even see the real light. They don't see the sun. That's even a whole other level. But I think it's a really good story because it does tell us something about the way we review data. In science, the whole idea is to collect data and to build a model. And so the data in this case is the shadow. And what we're trying to actually build, explore this object that we can't even see. So we collect data and we try to build the model, but the data is not perfect. The shadow is not perfect from this object. So we have to kind of account for the flickering light, the, the non-curve, the non-flat wall, all these things. You know, imagine if I had a circle and it casts a shadow. I think it might be a sphere, it might be a circle, I don't know. So we have all these problems, these limitations of collecting data that we that help us try to get to building this model. That's the idea of uncertainty, is how do we deal with this shadow that we have? Okay, so most of uncertainty has the following assumption. It assumes that data follows a normal distribution. So you've probably seen something like this in your grades Okay, if you have grades in a class, the, go the goal is to hopefully get a normal distribution. Um, in a normal distribution, you have an average. And so let's say this is um, height of people. Okay, the, the average height of a person may be 5'8", five, 5'10", five, feet or something like that. And there may be some people that are like 7 feet tall, but there's not that many of them. And there may be some people that are four foot ten, but there's not that many of them. So the extreme cases have fewer and fewer people in them, and most people are more close to the average. Not everything is like that, okay? But that is a normal distribution. It has two important things. This is a histogram of the number of values for different, va uh, the number of occurrences for different values. So there's two important things, and I'm not going to go into all the details, okay? But one is the average. What's the average value of this distribution? That's important. Number two is what's the standard deviation? The standard deviation is a measure of how wide this distribution is. So imagine where everyone had the exact same height, then the standard deviation would be zero. It'd be a super, super, super skinny peak, okay? So those are the two things that we want to try to get when we're me making measurements. So the um, that's what we're going to do. So this leads us to report those two values for any particular measurement. Suppose I measure a length, I want to report the average, and I want to report the uncertainty. And the uncertainty is a measure of the width of that distribution, assuming it's normal. Okay, but it, it may not actually be. But we're going to assume that. So the question is, how do you get the average? Well, that's you just average the things. And how do you get the uncertainty? Here I'm calling the uncertainty delta L. Okay, let's look at an example. Suppose I want to measure the diameter of this sphere. Okay, so I put the sphere on top of a ruler, but you can see that I have a problem here. Problem number one is it's not even a perfect sphere, all right? So if I measure the diameter in different directions, I probably get slightly different values because it's not perfectly spherical, and that's okay. Number two, I can't even line this up with my, with my ruler because it kind of sticks up a little bit. So I'm going to have to, I don't actually know the diameter. In this case, I'm going to approximate the diameter and I'm going to estimate the uncertainty. So I'm going to say this diameter is 5.1 centimeters and has an uncertainty of 0.1 centimeters. So that means that 
in all probability, most probable case, is that the diameter is between 5 centimeters and 5.2. So it's 5.1 minus 0.1 and 5.1 plus 0.1. Okay, so how did I get that 5? Well, the 5.1, I just measured the best I could. How did I get the 0.1 centimeters? If I have something where I can only make one measurement, I can't repeat it and get something new, then I need to estimate the uncertainty. So this is, I'm just going to use my own judgment, and I'm going to say, what's the value of that uncertainty? Uh, if I have a meter stick or some device, the best, the smallest uncertainty I could get is half of the smallest division. So here you can see on this uh, ruler, it goes down to 0.1 centimeters, so half of that would be 0.05 centimeters. In this case, I'm not going to use the smallest because I can't even line it up. So I'm going to, as a human, as a recorder, I'm going to put it at 0.1 centimeters. That's what I feel comfortable with. But that's something that you as the experimenter determine. Now suppose I do something else. What if I can repeat the measurement? So here is an example of dropping a ball. I dropped it seven times. And every time I drop it, I get a time that's slightly different because you know I'm using my stopwatch or whatever. I don't get the exact same thing. If I measure that ball seven times, I'm just going to get 5.1 seven times. So it's not going to give me any insight into how the, the variations and measurements change. But if I do something like this, I do. So I, here you can see my seven measurements. The first thing I need to do is find the average. Okay, so if you have uh, a spreadsheet, you can, you can use the average function, or you can just add up the seven values and divide by seven. That's the average. Now, what about the standard deviation? Um, you can calculate this by hand, okay? Um, there are a couple of different formulas for this depending on the size, but it's basically a measure. You find the average, and then you find the uh, average, the, you average the distance from the average for each data point. You square it so they're all positive, and then you add them up, and then you take the square root. Uh, but I'm not, I don't really, I don't mind if you just use a calculator because that's not really the important thing. So we get a standard deviation. Okay, so in this case, I would have, I drop the ball seven times, I get a time of 0.584, and I get a standard deviation of 0 0.04. Okay, and we'll talk about how to report those numbers in, later on. So that's the second way to get the uncertainty, is to repeat the measurement a whole bunch of times and find the standard deviation. Now there's another way to get the uncertainty. Suppose I want to calculate the area of this rectangle. I, I don't measure area. I measure length and width, and I use that to calculate the area. So here I have a width of uh, 6.62 plus or minus 0.1 centimeters. I just made this up. It's not real. Okay. And a length of 3.12 plus or minus 0.03 centimeters. So how would I calculate the area and the uncertainty in the area? This is where uh, we're going to do the crank three times method. Now, and I stole this, and I'm going to do another example. Uh, I stole this from Andy Runquist, who may have stole it from someone else, but just letting you know, that's where it came from. Uh, there are other ways to calculate the uncertainty from calculated quantities, but this is the easiest. Okay, so. so the crank number one is to calculate the area. Crank number two is to calculate the maximum area. Crank number three is to calculate the minimum area. So from the maximum area, I can find the uncertainty. So if you look right here, I have at first thing I do is calculate the area, length times width. Just ignore the uncertainty. Just calculate the length, the area, and I get 20.65. Next, I'm going to calculate a minimum maximum, doesn't matter which way, when we do first. The minimum area, I'm going to use whatever values of my calculation give me the minimum area. In this case, it would be the minimum length and the minimum width. So I'm going to take the minimum length is 3.12 minus the uncertainty of 0.03, and the minimum width is 6.62 minus its uncertainty. And when I do that, I get a smaller area. So in this case, it's clear to use the minimum length and width, but it's not always clear. So you may need to play around with the numbers to see what you get. Next, I'm going to calculate the maximum with the maximum length and width, and I get another value. Now to calculate the uncertainty, I'm just going to take the average distance of the maximum min from each other really. So max value minus min divided by two. And that's kind of like half of the half of the width. It's I know it's silly. And I get 0.5. So in the end I'll report the area as 20.6 plus or minus 0.5 centimeters squared. That 20.6 came from the average. 
right? And so what I did was, it's, it, there's no point in having the uncertainty multiple digits, because if you're uncertain at 0.5, who cares if it's 0.51 or 0.52? Just say go 0.5. And then if I have uncertainty at 0.5 centimeters, no point carrying the um, area to 20.65. The, the, the 5 one hundredths of the centimeter doesn't really make sense. Okay, how, what do we do with uncertainty? Well, we use this to compare values. Suppose I measure two time intervals, and they, I, I show them as uh, normal distributions. If those uncertainties for the two time intervals overlap, even a little bit, then we're going to say they could be the same thing. They could be part of the normal same distribution. If the two uncertainties don't overlap, we could say they're probably different. Okay. So if T2, the minimum T2 value is uh, greater is less than the maximum T1 value, then they overlap. If they don't overlap, then, then they could be different. Okay, so, oh, I did the same thing. Um, so here's T1. If you just get two times, you don't know if they're the same or not. T1 is 0.3, T2 is 0.33. Are they the same or not? Who knows? But if I do like this, if I have 0.31 plus or minus 0 0.005 and T2 is 0.33 plus or minus 0 0.01, one, then the maximum T1 is 0.315 and the minimum T2 is 0.32 and they don't overlap. So I would say those two values are probably different. However, if, I've, if I change that and I, in the second case, they do overlap and they, they could be the same. Okay, this was a question a student asked. They said, well, what about significant figures? Here are two times with different significant figures. The significant figures is a way, is a met, another method to keep track of the uncertainty in a situation. So if you have uh, 0.331 seconds, that's, that's a more uh, precise number than just 0.3. And so then there are rules for how you deal with calculating quantities with uncertainty. Um, in the end, uh, I just, I don't like it. So I like the uncertainty way better. So don't worry about the significant figures. Okay, so measurements have uncertainty. There's three ways to get uncertainty. Estimate the a single, not a signal, a single measurement, uh, and then that's your uncertainty. Two, repeat the measurements many times, not three, okay? More is better, and find the standard deviation and the average, and three, use a crank three times method, and then compare them. Okay, so let's do another example. This is one from class I gave. So a ball is shot from a launcher horizontally off the table, so it's shot horizontally, and I give the starting position, of 1.2 plus or minus 0 0.01 meters above the floor, and then it travels 1.3 plus or minus 0 0.005 meters. So what's the launch velocity with uncertainty? So the step one, crank one, find the average. Now in this case, I just I ignore the uncertainty. It doesn't matter. Okay. So it's a projectile motion problem. So in the y motion, I have uh, this kinematic equation: the y direction, y equals y zero plus v y zero t minus one half g t squared. So the final y is zero, the initial y velocity is zero since it's launched horizontally, so I can solve for time. Square root of two y zero over g. Now that same time is used in the x motion equation. So in the x motion, I have x equals x zero plus v x zero t, and I can solve for vx zero. And I get x times g over the square root of two y. I put in my values for y and x, and I get 2.2 I get 2.627 meters per second. Now, crank two, minimum velocity. Okay, so I have the same equation, right? It's still Vx zero is x times the square root of g over two y zero. But what values will give me the minimum velocity? So I'm gonna put in the minimum x because I'm multiplying by x, but I'm gonna put in the maximum y, right? Because I'm dividing by y. So if I put in a maximum y and divide by that, it makes a smaller vx zero. So here's a case where I need to look at the numbers I have in my equation, okay? And so I'm gonna put in the x minimum and the y maximum, and I get 2.606 meters per second. Okay, now for the maximum, crank three. Now I'm gonna switch those. Now I'm gonna put x max and y min, and I get 2.648 meters per second, okay? And I, if you need to pause this and look at the numbers, do that. I'm just going fast because I'm getting bored. 
Okay, so now I can calculate the uncertainty. It's the max velocity minus the minimum velocity divided by two. So it's 2.648 minus 2.606 divided by two. And I get 0.021. So I'm, again, I, I can drop that, that uh, one one thousandth of a meters per second because I don't really care. So that's just gonna give me a velocity of 2.63 plus or minus 0 0.02 meters per second. Okay, one last thing, um, graphing uncertainty. So how do I, if, I'm if I make measurements that have uncertainty and I wanna make a graph, how do I show that on the graph? And the answer is error bars. So in this graph, you have a dot representing the average and then a bar that represents the, the length of the uncertainty. So you can kind of see where, what range on that graph I actually think the value might be. This helps when I draw the best fit line. You know, it, I want to try to get through those error bars as much as possible and find my slope. There are much more complicated ways to deal with uh, error bars and graphing, but I just want to show you that there is error bars. There is a way to express uncertainty in a graph. Okay, so that's a super quick interview. That's just, no, no, it's not an interview. That's a super quick overview of uncertainty. And I'll stop there.